countries. Please join me and welcome Elizabeth Churchill. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Philippe. Thanks, um, Matt and Philippe, for having me here. And thank you for getting up. I'm already cheerful because you're actually here. So um, it's, this is called Reasons to be Cheerful, Part 4. And a lot of people have been asking me why. Well, back in the 70s, Ian Deary and the Blockheads in the UK had a hit called Reasons to be Cheerful, Part 3. Hopefully at the end of this, I'll actually play a bit of it. And if I don't get to, I want you to go and listen to it. And for me, this is a really, really important track, because every time I get a little gloomy, because the news is going on and on about, you know, everything being bad and surveillance and, you know, technologies are taking over the world, I think about this track and I think about this laundry list of things that Ian Dury in his sort of semi-rap style tells us, cheers him up when he's feeling a little down. These things include Buddy Holly, Summer, Parrot smiles, whatever that might be. Yellow socks, anyone here with yellow socks? Woo! <laughs> National health glasses. John Coltrane saxophone. Now what does all of this have to do with impact? or inspiration, and today I don't want to actually um, lecture to you, I don't really want to try and inspire you necessarily to anything in particular. I want to invite us all to think about what we can do when we're sort of feeling a little less than cheerful, about being cheerful, about the laundry list of things that we have that inspire us to keep going, <laughs> even if we think that the world is full of, you know, difficult things. So one of the things that HCI has always been good at is thinking about other people's points of view, other people's perspectives. One of the things I've been going around the conference that people are really focusing on is who is the user and how does that user, i.e. person, interact with the technologies that we're building or that we're imagining? There's a lot of work here also on maker communities and on people who are going out and entrepreneurially creating new technologies, participatory cultures. All of these activities that we have as a group, HCI, are really about imagining other people and imagining ourselves in other situations and learning from that and reflecting. And I think we as a community spend a lot of time, time noticing, trying to put ourselves into other perspectives around activities that are everyday and mundane, a bit like Ian Dury's list. These seem like pretty mundane things, but they're about taking yourself out of yourself to think differently and notice and reflect and think about how the world could be different. And our community is very much about questioning and questioning the status quo, questioning what we can do and what we're not doing. And I think that those things are really important. So it's not just about a reverie of imagining these things that cheer us up. It's also about engaging with what we can do differently or how the world could be done, could be constructed differently. So why does this matter? Well, I think everything feels like time is speeding up. Technological innovation is speeding up. Certainly in my context, it feels like things ship and move and change and there's no time to actually reflect. But I think that's not true. Does anyone else in this audience feel like everything seems to be going too fast? Yay! <laughs> I'm not alone. <clears throat> and I think that these moments that we take to reflect and sit back are really important, despite the fact that we feel we're on this rush and treadmill and so I'm inviting us all to spend some time thinking and being at the conference here is a really interesting 
space to think about how we do this because it's so busy and so packed full of so much amazing content and you're running around and talking to people and being inspired but part of what I want to do this morning is say remember to go back and take some of these ideas back with you and why does that matter you know there's a meta conversation here this isn't just about doing our jobs better it's also about us feeling better. So research forever has said that there are three things that make people enjoy life more. Your basic phys physiological needs, you're st having strong relationships with other people. And this is something I'd really like to call out here because the biggest predictor of whether you're gonna have a good time at work or not is the people you work with, it turns out. And I want you to look around here, because we work with some pretty amazing people. Even when they're being irritating, they're still pretty amazing. Um, we have a community that we can turn to, and so for me in industry, going back to my work context where I have amazing colleagues, but maybe colleagues who aren't trained in the same things that we are, and don't have the same perspective, I still know that this broader community exists. And I think that that's extremely important. And we have meaningful work, and it's up to us to try and make that work meaningful. I was talking about reflecting. It's really up to us to think about how we can change things and how we can stand behind producing the best products possible. And I think this comes back to this perspective I was talking about, that HCI is always about taking these alternative perspectives and understanding why they're important. And it's about bringing passion to that. Now, here are some key directions that the world is sort of taking, if you like. Massive investment in these from venture capitalists within industry globally. Proactive health and well-being. So I was just talking about our personal health, but it's the health of everybody. Um, health care is a massive, massive drain on resources. And a huge movement is really about us helping people be proactive before they get ill, before there needs to be something fixed. <laughs> and people taking responsibility for themselves for that. And there's a huge amount of research, obviously, that this community is sort of involved in and should be involved in around the technologies of monitoring and measuring. We had some really great conversations at the conference about quantified self and about the technologies that produce the data for quantifying and how that quantified self is not just a self but also the social context in which you sit the way you measure and manage your health affects your social context, and your social context affects your orientation and relationship to that. Most of the communities that are focused very specific on, specifically on the technologies forget the social dimension of the embeddedness of us with our technologies with others. I'm obviously very involved because I'm at eBay in marketplaces and exchanges. And again, at this conference, we've had a lot of amazing discussions around different forms of capital, social capital being one, but we've also talked, I've been at a couple of talks where we're talking about things like crowdfunding, we're talking about, as I mentioned, participatory cultures of, and exchange, we've talked about gift economies, we've talked about other ways of thinking about how people get onto marketplaces and how we as a community understand the ways in which those marketplaces are changing how labor takes place and how people learn and teach themselves. Again, I mentioned the maker communities. I think it's really interesting because we're all very engaged in creating new things and it's wonderful to see people on the ground trying to learn new things, learning how to program. I personally have just been um, playing a lot with uh, Leah Beakley's um, lily pad, which is based on like the Arduino, with conductive thread, and creating 
fashion. I'm not very good at it, but I think what's amazing in this community, again, is we support each other and we need to support other people being bad at things and learning. And I think this, this self-directed learning and education is a huge area of investment that we can participate in driving, helping. Data. Everyone's obsessed with data. Big data, small data, little data, good data, bad data. Data collection, data curation, data analytics, experimentation, and really importantly, interpretation. I'm going to say a little bit more about that as I go through. And this community is very engaged with, and we need to get more engaged with understanding that behind every quantitative measure, there is a qualitative judgment. It's not just about engineering, it's about deciding what to engineer, how to engineer it, what to do with the information, how to collate that information, how to interpret it and understand it. And that brings me back to those points of view and perspectives that we have to be engaged in designing not just the technologies and the interactions, but also designing the data so that it's fit for purpose, so that we can mine it and manage it to understand people's experiences. And I think this all comes together with this amazing dream of the Internet of Things. And I was looking at images last night to try and put a picture up for the Internet of Things. And a lot of those pictures of the Internet of Things, there aren't any people in them. They're things, but where, where it sort of, aren't we sort of in there somewhere and in the middle of that and changing that and affecting that? And aren't we co-creating our experiences with those semi-sentient or sentient things. And I think it's really important that we are part of that conversation too. And one of the things I'm working on a lot with my colleagues back at eBay is what I'm calling putting the person back into personalization. So personalization is this notion that we can target content based on your interests and needs that collaborative filtering will help us manage this amazing amount of information in the world. But very often I'm like, well, who's the person you're designing for? And if we imagine this perfect world of like an N of one, where everything is designed absolutely for you, and at the other world, end of the world, the other end of the continuum, where the data are so abstract in general that we're just assuming that you're sort of like everybody else, Somewhere in the middle for these different services is where we need to be part of the conversation. And we also need to help people help us and help the services curate their data effectively and talk about what's comfortable for them. Because there are also cultures of difference about how much information you want collected on yourself and what you're doing with it. So I've just put a few of the things up here, which we just know these aren't even particularly new. There's you know, been demos of various things here. But we barely understand how human biomechanics work and affect us emotionally and socially. Empathy, emotion, connection, eye gaze, the collection of information. Google Glass is an amazing example of sort of bifurcated passion. It is the best thing in the world, and it is the most evil thing in the world. And we have to be part of the conversation, <laughs> which says, actually, it's a little bit different. There's a little bit more nuance to this. And what is this technology figuring for the future, and how are we going to be part of that? More and more in the last few years, thank goodness we've got away from that screen of that image I showed from a while back. And we're actually jumping around and acknowledging that we're embodied and we can be in the world. This is the image I always like to use to illustrate the data point I made. We have our filters or sieves of, it says information coming in here, but you know, information, and then we filter, and then we come up with what we assume is a representation or a reflection of what someone's doing. We need to think about designing that sieve and that filter. We need to be part of that process, because Every time you take something in, there's something you leave on the table. And often, 
the really, really, really interesting things from a human perspective for me, they're sort of squeezed out in the residuals, <laughs> or they're left in the pulp, not processed. We've already done a lot of work, as I mentioned, emotion on frustration. This community was all about, you know, people say emotion is sort of new, isn't it? We're really getting our teeth into it. From the very beginning of HCI, we were thinking about frustration. We were thinking about efficiency tasks, but also frustration and problem solving. And that we need to understand emotion a lot better, and also the cultural embeddedness of emotion and how fragile emotion can be. We know that emotions and the body interact in very complex ways. We don't understand this yet. This is the classic arousal curve. I'm a psychologist originally, so I love this curve. Uh-oh, I jumped. How did I jump? Um, and emotion is really important because we know it affects quality of life. Um, there was a study called the Nun Study, and uh, over many, many, many decades, uh, there was an ethnographic research based on uh, autobiographies written by these nuns. And it turns out, because it's a very controlled environment, you can sort of make some assertions. It turns out that those who said that they were happier and had a positive affect on life to go back to the cheer, lived longer, and I bet you they actually had a better time living longer. So I'm gonna step back right now from saying we should be involved in a lot of conversations. We should think about reflecting. We should think about things like emotions. We should think about how we're affecting people and potentially giving them a better and longer life in, and ourselves. And say that whenever I go home, from a conference, one of the ways I try my laundry list mechanism for being cheerful about what I've learned, because it's very e easy to get into a lot of arguments and disagree with a lot of people. We're all academically trained, and we always love to find a flaw. Um, I would say that there are, and many of you probably have the same sort of structure, there are known problems with known solutions, where I go back and talk to my engineering colleagues, and I say, hey, why don't we think about this problem slightly different and there's a solution? There's a known problem with an unknown solution where I'm like, hey, I observed this particular problem and we don't know how to solve it. Let's really sort of do some advanced engineering around this. And then there's research or advanced research where we don't even really know what the problems are and we certainly don't know the solutions. And I think this audience and maybe our day-to-day -day portfolio is always made up of a little bit of each of those. So I like to reflect on that at any conference. So while I'm thinking about this, um, I also have a 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 that I do at every conference where I try to take ideas back and be cheerful and positive back in my industrial context or my research context. So I like to think about, and I want you to do this with me. I'm not telling you you have to do it but I'm asking you and inviting you and to share with me perhaps or share with each other what you come up with. Five things that you saw here that surprised you in a positive way. Now I know trained academics might find it hard to come up with five positive things, <laughs> but please. <laughs> and it, that could be, you know, I took somebody down in their argument, but be clear. I want you to think about four new methods, if you like, four new approaches to trying to understand something that you saw here in the demos or the exhibits or in the talks, something that you've not tried before. I want you to think of three people that you'd like to be in touch with, that you think you might actually build a collaboration with, possibly across some disciplinary boundary, because those alternative perspectives are really important. So let's not stay in our little subgroups. <laughs> I want you to think of um, two sub areas within your area of research that you might not have really thought that you could have an 
impact on. Remember, we're talking about impact. Two areas where you're out of your comfort zone a little bit that you think you might be able to bring and actually influence somebody. And that's going to bring me to my last thing, which is based on two quotes that struck me. I've been collecting quotes while I've been here. I do that too because there's so many amazing insights that people have. Margaret Atwood said very, at the very beginning, we make real things we have already imagined. And then Richard Ladner said that when he left theoretical computer science, he was excited about HCI because theoretical CS did not have a social impact award. And so what I want to remind us is that HCI has always been about advocacy, the other point of view, and it's always, always had a sense of ethics about what we do. What do we do? How does it have impact on others immediately? in the distance and potentially in the future. So for my last thing, what I'd like us all to think about, what I'm going to think about, is what's one grand challenge, one grand challenge that you can engage in that will potentially change the world? And then think about those people you're reaching out to, those methods you've learned, those inspirations you've had here and could have. And let's bring that to bear on trying to show that HCI as a discipline really is about people in the small, in the personal, and in the large. So help someone live longer, or at least help them enjoy a little bit on the way. Understand that cheer is optimism, confidence, but also courage. To look positively is to be courageous. And finally, if I can, I'm going to leave you with just a little bit of the song. And thank you very, very much. <laughs>